to the webinar. On, be on behalf of Digistore, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to be with us today. My name is Andrew Mooney and I'm the Managing Director of Digistore. We're excited to be able to bring you this webinar today. But before we get underway, I'll cover off a couple of items of housekeeping so you can get the most out of the webinar. First of all, Q&A. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to submit written questions via the Q&A as they occur to you. Click the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window on your screen and type your question. Please use the Q&A button, not the chat button. Um, although we may not answer all questions live during the webinar, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar where all presenters will be available to respond to questions. Uh, recording, if everything works as planned, the webinar will be recorded and a link to view on demand will be sent to everyone once we've prepared and uploaded the video. So first off, let me quickly introduce Digistore. Last year, 2020, marked Digistore's 30th year in business. As we move out of lockdown now, we are assessing new technologies and workflows that were born out of necessity over the preceding year or so, and looking at how they can now be applied in innovative ways in order to provide greater productivity, lower costs, and perhaps most importantly, flexibility for individuals and teams working in post and production. Combining Adobe Premiere Pro Productions and LucidLink's Cloud NAS solution has the potential to be a real eye-opener for those looking to exploit the benefits of cloud workflows, but avoid the complexities imposed by many other implementations. Digistore is excited to bring you this webinar today to explore those tools. Digistore addresses a wide range of application areas across many industries. I've summarized on this slide some of the areas we address around remote and live production, which would be relevant to the audience attending today, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg. I'd encourage you to get in touch with us to discuss any technology or technical service questions you have, whether it's how do I manage my remote post-production teams, or what's the best way to implement live production and delivery, or pretty much anything else. We're here to help you. Digistore works with a range of leading vendors. The close working relationship with our vendor partners allows us to leverage their staff and resources to work with us on solutions for your needs. Here are just a few relevant vendors that we work with. Importantly, for anyone looking at Adobe workflows, Digistore is Australia's first Adobe certified partner for video and audio. This means we can now offer broadcast, post-production and media companies the services to analyze requirements, propose solutions, and undertake custom development for Adobe workflows. With direct access to Adobe's technical experts, we work closely with Adobe to define and implement the most ideal workflows and pipelines. Our engineers have undertaken a comprehensive range of courses and exams to ensure they thoroughly understand the Adobe product offerings, the product's open architecture, APIs, and how to extend the products and integrate into customer-specific workflows. Of course, we can't answer all of the questions or address all the specific workflows and requirements for everyone in this session. So I'd encourage you to contact your Digistore account manager or Digistore generally so that we can help you further. Here are our main contact and communication channel details, but feel free to reply to the emails for this webinar at any time. Look out for our webinar follow-up email with further information as well as the recording link. Okay, let's have a look at the agenda we have for you today. We'll start with short presentations to frame your understanding of what the two technologies we are discussing, that's Adobe Premiere Pro Productions and LucidLinks Cloud Mouse, um, and include a short demo of each. John and David will then provide a technology experience demo to show you how these two technologies really can work well together. Then Darius will provide some insight into his experiences evaluating, implementing and using these technologies to undertake real world productions. Then we'll have some time left for Q&A with all presenters. Okay, so let's get this show on the road. I'd like to introduce Digistore's guest presenters today. 
We've got John Barry from Adobe, David Leopold from Lucidlink, and Darius Family from PostLab IO. We are very pleased to have these presenters as they bring a wealth of experience to the webinar, not only from a product and technical implementation point of view, but also from real world production point of view in Darius's case. So to kick off the presentation, I'm pleased to announce the one and only first webinar for today, John from Adobe. Over to you, John. Thanks, Andrew. Let me just screen share from my side, make sure sound is on, great. Okay. So here we are talking about Adobe Premiere Pro Productions. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's been out for about a year now, um, and it's part of an optimized long form workflow. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in this particular presentation. So, there is actually a best practices workflow guide that's been put together and you can go and find that link here, the bit.ly link that I've put in, Adobe Productions Guide, one word, uh, that will get you to the PDF to download and then you can go through the process yourself um, and get much more detail. The QR code as well will work. So if you do a quick screenshot, you can then use your phone to get to that later on. Now I wanted to go through a bit of a history here as to how we got to this point where productions actually came to be. There was quite a few different processes in play and it's taken some time working with our Hollywood customers to actually put it through its paces and make sure that it's going to be production ready by the time it comes out into the public release of Premiere Pro. So you can see there's quite a few different um, big name projects that were using productions and giving us that feedback. Across the bottom there, I've just highlighted that there are a few different things that needed to be put in place in order for productions to mature. Multiple open projects was an absolute requirement and Premiere Pro was never really designed to do that in its early stages. So that was a, a big feature that we needed to uh, put in place. And then having the ability to actually share projects and have them then lock. So if you had someone else that was opening a project that it would be in a locked state if you were the first to open it up. And we've combined these processes to then turn into the productions experience. Locally, we had Siamese based in Perth. Uh, Merlin Eden is the uh, editor that began this process in Australia, the first production company in Australia to start using productions way back when it was still in beta. It wasn't even released yet. Um, he was able to get on the private beta version of it and downloaded that guide, which pretty much hasn't changed since then. And I didn't get any phone calls, which was great because it meant that it was working the way that it was expected. And he was more than happy with the way that it works. So he's continued to use that as his standard way of um, managing his feature films that he works on. Um, across the top there, ABC Australia have been using productions now for quite some time. Play School is one of those. Uh, programs that utilizes the platform and you can imagine that that's quite a large um, format for tv series programming every day of the week and then we've got post lab so very very um, excited to hear what darius has to say some great stories there and across the bottom there this is not a comprehensive uh, view there's a lot more editors out there that i know that are using it but laurie silverstrand based in perth as well he got to um, transfer one of his really big heavy projects and split it out across multiple projects inside the production ecosystem. Uh, Patrick McKay based here in Melbourne and Paul Murphy as well, also based here in Melbourne, have been using it and have got their own um, stories to tell. So what is Premiere Pro Productions? It's included in Adobe Premiere Pro. So if you have the 2021 version, it was out of the box. It was there, ready to go. Doesn't cost any extra. It's using standard PR, PROJ data, it's just setting it up in a way that it can be cross-referenced. It's a very unique way that Adobe is allowed for multiple standard projects in order to be cross-referencing each other. And it also allows for transparent collaboration. So there's a panel that you can see called the project, sorry, the production panel and allows all the editors that are part of that ecosystem to see what's happening and who has what project open. Quick overview of the way that the shared projects management uh, can be seen and just a basic idea of the way that it works. This is the production uh, panel 
inside of Premiere Pro. And you can see it's quite comprehensive in that we have the ability to manage and see, oversee um, folders that are managing particular projects and maybe what status they're in and then the projects themselves. So in essence, what's happening here is there's a splitting of the actual load of all the data associated to the final production. So if we have a sort of a bit of a view here, lens here on what this looks like as more than these particular states, we've got three here that I'm gonna walk through, but there's a few more. And if you get that PDF, you'll see um, with finer detail exactly what everything means. The final cut aspect project uh, we can see is open by Mr. Edit. And the icon there shows a white filled in icon with a green right pencil. That means that that person is on this machine and they are the one that has right control. You can also see the size of the file. And then with this one, we're looking at an opened by someone else on another system. So this is on central storage, it only works through a central storage solution. And I can see that Mike Burton has that open. I can open it on my machine, but I can't make changes to it. So I can see what they're doing and I can make use of what they have done inside the project that they own. And then the final one here uh, is an unopened project. There's no name next to it. So that means nobody has it open and has it in write mode. And again, you can see the size of these files. Now, very loosely rule of thumb, what we're doing here is we've split out across these different projects, the load of saving and um, opening that data is now split across three separate projects. Although they are intelligently cross-referencing each other, it means that your open times and your save times are going to be much faster. Here's a real world example. I worked with the Australian Screen Editors Guild to put together something with uh, production company Stump Jump. They have a TV series, it's a one hour series. And this episode was a 57 minute episode um, about Cuba, traveling through Cuba. And when I went and saw these guys, they had a compressed PRPROJ file that was 583.5 megabytes in size. Now, if you were, and I don't recommend you do this, but if you were, to change that file extension to a .zip and then unzip it, you'll see the raw data because a Premiere project file is actually compressed data. When we unzipped it, it was 1.6 gigabytes. That starts to make things make a bit more sense, why things take so long to open and why they take so long to save as well, because it has to take the raw data, compress it, uncompress it, and then so on and so forth. Now, when we converted this project through the productions ecosystem and had multiple projects that were working on specific components of the overall production, he was able to whittle down his working timeline down to 193.1 megabytes, which when unzipped was only 344.8 megabytes of raw data. So save times and launch times were much quicker. Okay, I've pre-recorded a getting started uh, video here that just goes through the basics of how to get started and then also how to bring in a project that's already had a lot of work done. And then you can start to split it out because the system is actually that flexible that you don't need to start at the very beginning from scratch. You can convert things that have already had quite a bit of work done to them, which is what Stump Jump had actually done. As you can see, we've started with Premiere Pro 2021. And in order to start a new production, you simply go to file, new production. Now there's nothing special here. I'm gonna rename the production name, which will create a folder inside this particular folder. This will enable the project locking collaboration preferences. You really wanna have this on central storage if you're gonna have other people open and manage different projects. Okay, we've got an untitled project. We'll just rename this um, edit01. And then I'm going to create a new folder in here as well. And then I'm going to drag and drop that inside of this particular folder. Now, if I right click in here, you can see I've got new project as well. I can also add a project to the production. If I add in here a project that I've been working on already. Now, 
here you need to copy this because the original file, you want to leave that where it is. We're not converting it. We're actually making a copy and putting that inside of the folder structure of the production. Now you can see in the production panel, it's opened um, a reference to it. Let's take a look at what this looks like. If I right click and reveal in Explorer, I'll show you what's happening at the storage level. Let's go back one folder here and look at the location is productions and then JB's amazing films TV series. That's the production folder that I made. And then inside here, everything is managed. Now I made an edits folder inside of the production panel and it's reflecting here at storage where if I go inside, I see that's where the edit 01 project is. All right, let's take a look at the final edit project. And then inside my uh, project edit 01, I'm gonna do a couple things. So the first thing I want to do here is actually create a new sequence using at the beach footage. And I'm going to drop it on top of the new item icon, which would create a new sequence. So now when I look at this, I'm looking at a sequence that's got references to clips that are not part of this project. They're actually cross-referenced to another part of the project. So I can still hit F and match frame, like so. But then if I know I need more clips that are from where that clip is, and it's somewhere in here, I'm not sure exactly where, let me just close all that up to demonstrate how reveal in project actually launches the project and highlights the clip. So the workflow is essentially the same as what you would expect with a single project that's managing everything, except now it's able to cross-reference across other projects. And that is basically how to get started with productions. Okay. Well, hopefully that made sense to everybody. Um, Adobe is actually next week having its major event called Adobe Max. And if you want to learn more about the video solutions and productions and where LucidLink are actually one of our partners at the event as well, you'll be able to go a bit deeper into understanding and share across other colleagues and other people in your organization for them to be able to get access to a free virtual event um, called Adobe Max. Just go to max.adobe.com to register for free and then sign up for all of the different content that's going to be on next week. And that is the end of my presentation. Great. I will uh, introduce myself. Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Dave Leopold. Uh, I am a 20 year uh, creative in film and television. I've worked as an editor, motion graphics artist. In addition, I've also been a post supervisor and a workflow technologist. And now I'm so excited to be joining LucidLink to help try to bring some of these great solutions and abilities uh, to the entire industry. Um, so for anyone who's not familiar with LucidLink, I want to give you a quick overview. We take cloud storage and we transform it into a local file system. So you need to sort of unthink and unlearn what you already know about how the industry works with cloud storage and, and media in the cloud and try to imagine a drive that's with you everywhere you go can be plugged in basically through any internet connection. There's no more need for lengthy downloads. There's no changes to your workflow. There's no more filling up hard drives, local hard drives, and there's no more falling out of sync with your team. We're enabling virtual and remote collaboration across the globe. And as a reminder, I am actually not in Australia. I am coming to you from San Diego, California, across the Pacific. So what I wanna do is I wanna show you first a little bit about how LucidLink works. And then I'm gonna give you a quick demo. So there are three components to the LucidLink service. There's the LucidLink client, which is the software that's downloaded onto your computer and installed. It's one lightweight piece of software. And basically to get going, all you need to do is log in. There's the LucidLink service, which is a metadata coordination service. And there's the object store, which is your cloud provider. So when I go to upload something to the cloud, 
first of all, everything is written and read through the client. That's where the encryption happens. Everything is super secure. I won't go into it right now, but we have security that is second to none. The loop, when you go to upload a, uh, a file to the cloud, two things happen. First, the metadata and the data are separated. And that metadata on its own is synced with our metadata coordination service. So immediately, you will see on, on the cloud drive uh, that, that the file has appeared. What you need to know too is that LucidLink will appear on your computer as though it is a local drive. So it's scalable like the cloud, it's shareable like a NAS, and it performs like a local disk. So that metadata syncs with the cloud so that everyone connected to your LucidLink file space knows what those files are, and they see them as though they are files that already live there. The second thing that happens is the data from the file, which has been stripped off of the metadata, is broken down into tiny little blocks. Traditionally, one file equals one object in object storage. But with LucidLink, one file equals many objects. Each one of these blocks is 256 kilobytes in size by default and gets encrypted by the LucidLink client. All of those tiny little blocks are sent via parallel streams to the cloud. So everything is going so much faster than it would if you were trying to send one heavyweight file. And I'm going to show you what this actually looks like when I log on to LucidLink. I'm going to launch my LucidLink client. It's opening my file space. And this is the folder. It's called LucidLink demo. It appears on my Mac, uh, just as it would if it were an attached drive. This works on Mac, PC, and Linux, and it works on every S3 compliant or Azure blob storage bucket. Um, but if I open up my media assets folder, first, the first thing you should notice is I have over a petabyte of storage that's now completely and instantly accessible on my local system. I can go in, Again, none of these actually live locally on my, on my computer, but I can go and I can preview any of these files in real time. Hopefully you're seeing how smooth it is for you. On my side, it is smooth as silk. I can never really be sure how, how it presents over webinars, but hopefully it is very, very smooth. And if I were to go into Premiere and I can take any one of these clips, I'm just gonna drag it over virtually any size, I can put it on a timeline and right away I can play it down without dropping a single frame. That's how fast and easy it is to work with LucidLink. Now, again, I mentioned that everything was happening in blocks. Just to give you a little bit more peek behind the curtain, what happens is as I'm jumping around in a sequence and accessing these blocks, LucidLink isn't trying to deliver the entire file to me. It's only delivering the blocks that I need on demand just in time. So if I skip ahead a little further, it hasn't downloaded or synced with the blocks that I haven't used. It's pulling just the blocks I need. If you think about it this way, a video file, video is a temporal file. It happens over time. There's no way to watch an entire video in one moment. So there's really no reason that we should have to download an entire file to watch one single moment. If you have a 30 minute interview, but you only need 10 seconds from the middle, you shouldn't have to wait 20 minutes for that whole video to download, depending on your network speeds. So what we found is that LucidLink actually works incredibly well, not only with Premiere Pro, but with productions and the production panel within Premiere Pro. And actually, John and I sat down and did a little demo of this to show you how well this works to keep everyone involved in a production in sync with each other without missing a step. So John, I'm going to throw it back to you for that demo.
Okay, give me one second to share my screen. With sound. Okay. Okay, David, you and I have started to put together already a production using Lucidlink and I've shared to you a folder. So I have multiple folders within this and I'm on Windows. So I just want to show how this is set up in that my Lucidlink folder. So if I look at my Windows view, I can see that I've got a C drive, my system drive, I've got some other external drives and a Google drive as well. And the Lucidlink drive for me shows up as drive L because that's how the volume loads for Windows. How does that look on your side, given you're on Mac? Yes, yeah, so I am on a Mac, and the Lucidlink drive just appears on the left-hand side of the uh, Finder window. Cool. Just as, th as though it's any attached drive. I have the demo test folder, and inside of that i have four other folders footage outputs productions and projects cool so you're not seeing chinwag or cw replays or review or any of these other folders as well as demo test you just have demo test correct i only have the folder that you gave me access to awesome so then okay so this is a really cool way of being able to manage the kind of files that different users actually have access to and uh, inside what I've shared to you, we can see that we've got productions is one of the folders in there. And we've also got footage as well. So we'll be utilizing this um, as well as utilizing the productions folder, which has the name of the production. In this case, it's Adobe Productions Lucid Link is the name of the production itself. And then inside of that, we can see that we've got the Premiere project files, they're just standard files. We've also got the lock files that open and are associated to whosever machine the system actually opens the project first, locking out other users. Let's, uh, let's just jump into Premiere Pro and I can see here in my production folder an overview of what's happening as far as the project is locked by which user. So my preferences are set up to show my name as the JB Edits. And Dave, yours is set up to be David Leopold, one word. And I can see on my side that you have opened Ingest. And that to me shows Correct. that it's a locked project with a, a red padlock. Now I don't have it open just yet. I'm just about to open that up just so we can see what that looks like on my side. So from mm -hmm. here, I can see the project panel is opened. It's got the name in Jest, and then in brackets, it's got your name, and then it has a padlock next to it as well. If I look in the bottom left corner, I can see it's got a bright red padlock, and that means that I can go in and I can see and I can play back any clips or sequences that you might have in there but I can't make any changes. So if I wanted to change the name of say a folder here and I start putting in underscore JB and then I hit enter, it rejects it. It's unable to make changes because I don't have right permission. So on your side, could you actually add in a folder and some clips that then sure. I'm gonna utilize? So you keep control of that project. So I added a folder called Adobe Stock, and I'm going to take some footage from Dave, from the from Dave folder on Lucidlink, and just drag it right in. I'll go ahead and give it a quick save. Cool. And you should be able to see it. I see that straight away. So that was really quick, really responsive. On my side, I see that I've got this warning symbol next to the padlock indicating that I need to refresh. So I'm just gonna go in and refresh the project. I've set up a keyboard shortcut for that as well so I don't have to keep clicking through. But now I get to see, even though it's still locked, I get to see an updated view where I've got access to the folder you've created and then the clips that you've put inside that folder. Now on my right here, I've got a sequence that's part of a different project. 
So if I was to reveal the sequence in the project, so over here I've got my other project, which is just for edits, and it only holds sequences. So here you can see I've just got rough cut, although inside of my rough cut, I've actually got some clips. I've got assets sitting inside the sequence. Now where they are located is in a different project. So if I was to right click on any of those clips and reveal in project, it actually launches the project and that's how I'm managing these different types of assets and different processes. So they're in a compile project where there's some audio sync that's needed to be done and that's being prepped as a multicam and then I'm utilizing the multicams as clips in a separate project that's just for edits. Now I've still got the locked version of ingest where I've now got the new uh, files that I'm able to work with. And I'm just gonna drag them inside of my sequence whereby those clips stay inside the ingest project. They have not moved or duplicated into my edits project. And this is where the cross-referencing really comes into play. Super powerful. And it's pretty awesome that these clips can be coming in um, even before they're fully downloaded and ready to go. So let's just show how that works. Could you upload a new asset that's gonna take a little while to sync? Sure. So I'll put it into the David folder and there it goes. It, the upload is beginning and I can actually see how much of that upload still remains as it ticks down. Cool. So on my side, let's see, it's in David. Okay, so you've put a stock clip inside your folder there. All right, I'm just gonna open that inside the source panel inside of my Premiere Pro and I can start sampling this straight away. So is that finished syncing up on your side? Uh, no, it's about halfway. Okay, cool. So this is pretty awesome in that I'm able to sample it and start playing it like immediately. So because the blocks have synced with the cloud, you can now watch up to the point that is now synced with the cloud. That's pretty cool. All right. So let's see, if I was to then add this into my project, and because I've just loaded in the source, meaning it's not associated to any project yet, by adding it into my project with a sequence, that adds it to the project that holds the sequence. Okay, uh, let's see, let's zoom in onto that so I can start playing that out. I'm able to work with that without it needing to be completely finished. And if we had a really large file that's already in the cloud, but I haven't synchronized it all yet. I'm only grabbing around the playhead of where I'm trying to play out. So I don't need to play out and, and cache the entire clip in order to then just play the section of in and out range that I'm actually trying to watch. All right, so the last thing we'll do here is showcase how the management of these projects um, takes place. What I just want to highlight here is if I right click on top of my compile or my edits projects and reveal an explorer on my side, on a Windows side, it actually brings up where in the folders that this, this lives. And I can see here, it's actually living inside my JB folder. So there's a David folder, there's a grade ready folder. And so we've got different ways that we can manage these files the project files without needing to have Premiere Pro open. You can do it either way. David, if you just move your ingest project. Sure. There we go. So I can see that that's no longer living in there. And on Premiere Pro's production panel, I can see that it is now inside the David folder. So looking inside here, I've got the clip and then I've also got your Premiere project file there too. So this is a really clever way of being able to manage. We're all doing this remotely. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Where are you, David? I'm in San Diego, California. There you go. And we're doing this in practically real time. Pretty cool.
Great, thank you. So one thing I want to touch on is Premier Pro Productions is really the the collaborative tool that a lot of professional editors have been looking for. But the one requirement is that there is central storage that everyone's attached to. And until now, to have that centralized performance, uh, it's required on-prem storage. But what LucidLink does is it takes that storage and moves it to the cloud, allowing us to all collaborate in a way that we never have been able to before, wherever you are, as long as you have an internet connection. So I am going to actually throw to Darius family from uh, PostLab IO, and uh, he's going to talk a, li a little bit about his experience. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, shout out to everyone in Melbourne who's getting excited to uh, leave lockdown tonight at 11, 11.59 p.m., so at midnight. Um, so I'll pull my screen up here. Um, so basically, uh, I run a post-production company here in Melbourne called PostLab IO, and we've been using uh, LucidLink and Premier Productions for uh, the good part of this year. Um, we, the, our company started about five years ago, um, and we've uh, mainly focused on feature and documentary post-productions. Um, we're not really a company that has internal editorial space. So our, our process is really supporting uh, editors and assistant editors who work offsite. Um, and that's been something that we've done frequently since the beginning of our company. We found that a lot of our editors and assistant editors had their own spaces. Uh, production companies had an edit suite or, you know, um, editor had a studio somewhere and shared space, blah, blah, blah. So, so we've never really had um, localized edit suites and you know primarily what we're doing is the finishing component but then also overseeing the overall technical uh, pathway for a film um, and so having a some kind of remote setup is has always kind of been in a, a key part of our process even you know pre-pandemic we were operating with these kind of remote satellite offices um, and, it, you know, working uh, remotely previously, we had a couple of different sort of hacked together solutions that we used to keep, um, uh, our, you know, edit editors' drives and material sort of in sync. Um, John Barry came to us in, I think it was February, was it Feb this year, John? I think it was, we were looking to, we had a couple of productions that were we were looking to use with Premier Productions. Um, we hadn't heard about Lucid Link at all. Um, and, you know, John was like, hey, if you, you know, you're using Premier Productions, do you, have you heard about, have you thought about using Lucid Link? And we were sort of like, oh, what's, what's Lucid Link? And so John came into the office and showed uh, my business partner, Nick, Lucid Link. And Nick sort of looks across the room to me and goes, this is we've got to get this kind of thing and I sort of put my skeptical hat on and was like oh sure you know we'll, some exciting new technology but we'll just take it slow um the that that week Nick on a, on the weekend messages me and he says oh you know I've set up a um I've set a little test project up for you on lucid link and so I'm sitting at home and um I download the installer, log in, and there's a little folder there with a project in it, which I boot up in Premiere on my laptop um, and started scrubbing around and it was just working. And, you know, it's, um, it, the, I think seeing uh, David show it on the webinar doesn't really quite do it justice because it is like, it is instant. It feels like it is, feels like you're accessing something locally. Um, and so about two weeks later, we'd moved all of our productions onto LucidLink. Um, it replaced what our, it replaced our existing workflow, which was to use a tool called sync thing to keep, to, you know, kind of keep storage in sync. Um, whereas now what we have actually is a, is a, a cloud NAS essentially. It's the best way of, the best way of putting it. So it's collaborative, it's live and everyone can access it at the same time. And um, it's just so quick. 
uh, it and it really it it enables our editors and assistant editors to work um, very quickly, um, you know, on material without having to wait for it to finish downloading. So, um, an example of a typical one of our typical workflows. So, I mean, we have uh, we've got. I think it's about four documentaries running at the moment um, and another four narratives. Um, and so the, the usual process for us throughout this year um, has been, you know, during production, we will receive all of the rushes. Um, we'll process the dailies. So we'll make the proxy files. Um, and we have internal assistant editors that will work to do syncing um, into a pre into a premiere project. So, so we'll process all the proxies locally and we'll sync it locally. We do all of our work kind of internally and then we'll, we move the material onto Lucidlink, which is kind of like us giving it as a dailies lab turnover um, to the editorial team. Um, the, the fantastic thing that Premiere Productions offers is that similar workflow that you're kind of used to with uh, working in like a media composer project where you have, you're able to bring projects in or bins in um, and integrate them with an existing set of projects. And so what that means for us is that, you know, we can do all of our daily syncing and, and move the material into the project. The editor immediately has access to it because the material is up, uploading so quickly and in, and in these really small pieces, the second that the editor or the assistant editor has the bin of the project, they can start accessing it. Um, and so it's really become uh, an incredibly core piece of technology for us. Um, and, and it's not just for production workflow, for editorial workflow, I think as well, we use it for things like just general data transfers, moving large data sets around. Um, it's it's the fastest tool that we have access to. Like it's it's incredibly quick. Like we've discovered that our internet connection has like a twenty percent overhead <laughs> on it. We started transferring stuff. I'm like, this is going a lot faster than what we're paying for with our ISP. Um, and so we use it to move um, to move material around. So often we'll we'll transfer rushes for shoots for international shoots back to post houses in other countries. And and one of the benefits there of of, of doing that as opposed to another uh, you know other types of file services is that they have immediate access to it and they can pull down what they want in whatever order that they want. Um, and so it makes it very it's a it's it's kind of a it's a more efficient way of, of working remotely because yeah, you can pull the material as you need it. You're not waiting for the whole data set to come down. Um, so, so yeah, Luc you know, using Lucidlink as a central storage solution is really, I mean, the, the technology just works in, in so incredibly well um, that, you know, every it's, it has, yeah, it's really become quite uh, integral to us. And I think, it's you know for what what we've experienced in real world scenarios is that you want to have your team working with uh, working with internet connections that are reliable. Um, so you know you don't want a director uh, working off a hotspot, you know, with their laptop. And you know we'll we'll put a lot of the team on. So a lot of our productions, the director will often have access to the project and be wanting to maybe certainly for documentaries be doing their own little assemblies and string outs and things so you do want to you know you do need to treat it like a it's a it's a very professional tool and you've got to you know treat it in that manner and so um, we find that when we have the the um, editors and assistant editors and directors in a they can be working from home um, but just with a, you know, some, in some instances, we'll make sure that the director, we might get an Ethernet cable and hook them to their Wi-Fi rather than, you know, rather than them being on their Wi-Fi that's in their garage, you know, we want them to have a little bit of a lower latency. So we'll give them an Ethernet cable and, and run it to wherever their computer is. So there are sort of some um, practical considerations that you want to make to, as you would really with any piece of technology is to, just to ensure that your, I guess, lowest common denominator user, uh, you know, every 
every production has a user that will somehow manage to uh, find a way to break a, a process that you've worked very hard to, to put together. And so, um, but I think once everyone understands the way, the way the technology works, um, which is very straightforward, you know, it's kind of a, it's a 15 minute conversation with most people um, for them to, to kind of get up to speed with it. Um, and so, you know, a good, another good way of looking at it for producers to consider it is like, it is, it, it's a, it's like a Dropbox on steroids, which probably the guys will hate me using that <laughs> comparison, you know, it's, but it, it very much, it, it appears to the end user the same way you would expect a, a, any, a Google Drive or a Dropbox to appear. It's sitting there on your desktop and you've got access to files, but unlike, you know, it's, it's probably not a great comparison because it's, it'd be like a comparing a airplane to a car, you know, it's like a, they're both transport mechanisms, but one of them's not going to get you across the sea. So um, lucid link is just, it works. It's so snappy. And so, um, as I've said, you can't, you just can't tell that it's not local. And I think that that's really the key. And I think that definitely if there's a takeaway from the webinar today is that like you 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 really do need to test it this is something that once you test it you're just going to be like oh my god we you know this is it's just become yeah it's become so core for post lab um yeah uh Dar darius if, if i can just jump in quickly to co uh comment on your uh dropbox com comparison <laughs> um well you're you're absolutely right it it really does uh, show the the extreme difference between something like LucidLink and and Dropbox, because not only are you not downloading the entire file, you're not downloading anything. You're streaming blocks when you need them, and when you talk about the fact that you're streaming, that also means that you're not replicating the files. So that means that every user who has to access a file through Dropbox is downloading it to their local system. So you're replicating files, you end up with multiple versions, you're filling up hard drives. Whereas with LucidLink, everyone is able to pull from the exact same source. And you know we refer to it as the single source of truth. Everyone on your team has access to the, the exact same file without replicating it over and over again. Yeah, and that's, that's definitely what makes it so, so pow powerful with the um, Premiere Productions workflow is that is, is the I mean, there's no other tool really that I know of that streams, that pulls the data down in such an intelligent manner. And I mean, that's what enables so the fact that you can, you can scrub through footage uh, as if it was local. It's, in, you know, it's really quite, it's really quite incredible. Um, and, and having, and yeah, as you say, having it has been that single source of truth makes it very much you know it does make it like it's a NAS it's like there is only one there's one true version of the file that everyone is accessing accessing um and so yeah it's really it, it, it works incredibly well with productions um so I'm just having a little scroll scroll here through some of the um some of the Q&A's that's kind of my spiel really I did have this other slide which I forgot to <laughs> I forgot to put up. Um, I think I've gone through it though. That tip, that daily's process workflow. Um, yeah, using turnovers, blah blah blah. It's okay. quite. It, it is really. It's yeah. It's it's good. It's adaptable. You know. So I think that there's a lot of different use cases for this tool. Um, and you know, certainly for us, it's it's just become integral for that shared remote storage solution. Um, but, you know, beyond what we would ever have expected from a shared cloud-based solution, I think. Okay. Um, that's, uh, that's fantastic, um, uh, Darius. Uh, it's really, really good to get some uh, real-world real world experience on that. Um, uh, we do have a little bit of time left for some additional Q&A. So we'll just have a look at what questions are... Um, are uh, remaining there. Um, might be able to field these through. I think we've answered the one relating to um, the difference between Dropbox and Google Drive. 
um, unless David wanted to add anything more to that. I think that was uh, that was uh, answered well. Uh, that one off. Um, uh, is there known examples of upload speeds from remote shoots over 4G? Could an editor be working with data within hours of a shoot happening? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think you know, for us, we're working, we're working with an overseas shoot at the moment that's using LucidLink to transfer the data back to us. It really just depends, I think, on the on the speed, the quality of the 4G connection. Like it, the limiting factor is, you know, really is just the internet connection. So whatever the speed is of that person's 4G is how long you'd be able to transfer it. So LucidLink really doesn't stand in the way at all um, in that regard. Okay, fantastic. Correct. And and uh, what I what I'd also say to that is. Um, we do, we're, we're currently working with several customers on uh, camera to cloud. So it's not even a matter of uh, waiting a few hours, but waiting minutes or even seconds. LucidLink can work with growing files. So as you're shooting, a file is hitting the file space. As it's growing, you can drag it into Premiere. And as it's still growing and recording, you can start working with it in Premiere. Uh, I, I do want to just reference one one question asking about what size it says what size proxies for a painless experience. The amazing thing about LucidLink is you don't need to work with proxies. You can work with full res files. You can work with uh, HD, UHD. Your uh, network speeds may come into play once you get up to 8K, but because you're only streaming parts of the file, those blocks of the file, you don't need to worry about how big the file is when you're, uh, you, you don't need to download a large file. You're just streaming little blocks. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, got another one here for you, David. Um, uh, are there any cases of LucidLink being used in large scale institutions such as universities? Uh, we are starting to work with uh, higher higher education uh, organizations across mainly the U.S., but we are at large large enterprise companies with thousands of users uh, as as it stands right now. Okay, fantastic. Uh, does LucidLink let you mount a drive, which is actually this streaming source of footage? So, can you see this? at the OS level, such as Finder on the Mac. In other words, can you browse through the media that way or is it only visible via Premiere Pro? No, it, it is visible to your local system as an attached drive. So what's, what's pretty cool is LucidLink is just seeing a local drive mounted. So Luc uh, Premiere Pro doesn't know that LucidLink isn't, isn't on your computer. Uh, that these files in LucidLink aren't on your computer. It thinks that it is. So it is at the workstation at your computer level that it comes up as a drive. Okay, fantastic. Um, and that's the same drive, obviously. That's the same drive that will you can mount on multiple systems. So it's really, um, it's really just Correct. like a, a, how you'd mount a normal NAS. Exactly. Um, this is more of a... Um, uh, more of a sort of a workflow question. Once production is complete, so um, might be one more for Darius. Once production is complete, do you simply move the files off LucidLink to another drive for long-term storage? Uh, yeah, I mean, we you know we we kind of use Lucid as the editorial system. So so once the production is 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 fully wrapped up, we we bring it back into our kind of on-site data management process, and usually it goes onto tape. Okay, fantastic. Uh, got a little bit more of a technical one here, probably for David. Uh, can you explain a little bit about how LucidLink snapshots work and how much of your cloud storage they occupy? Is that something we can answer today or maybe come back on that one? Uh, I, can, I can come back with more details, but basically LucidLink snapshots are a series of archive and disaster recovery so that if you accidentally change a file, delete a file. Uh, it is not removed from garbage collection. 
and you can access, remount it and access it. Any user with access can mount and pull things back that have been taken uh, in error, or this can also protect you against, you know, hacks and, and ransomware as well. Fantastic. And is there a maximum storage size for a LucidLink folder? Uh, no, no. LucidLink file spaces can be petabytes in size. Uh, it's really as scalable as whatever the cloud storage that, that you're uh, engaging with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just a quick question regarding egress charges when working with LucidLink and uh, Premier uh, on a Premier project. Yes. Uh, so currently, we have a partnership with IBM that gives uh, lowered egress charges. So egress, egress is going to be on, on you as the user right now. Uh, IBM gives you three, three cents per gigabyte uh, for egress through our partnership, whereas some of the others are probably around nine cents. So uh, we're, we're talking about a third of the cost, but that, that is something that is managed by the user. Okay, uh, fantastic. Now we still have some questions there. Um, I might just close off the, uh, the webinar and for those people uh, that would like to stay on the line, we're still available for 10 minutes or so to, um, uh, to answer some of those remaining questions. Uh, so let me just step through here. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you all for joining the event today and a big thank you to our presenters, uh, John, David and Darius. Um, as a reminder, you can see Digistore's contact details on the screen, so please don't hesitate to contact us or me personally with any questions or requests for advice or assistance. Uh, for those that would like to stay on, we'll be here for another 10 minutes or so to, um, uh, to answer any, any of these remaining questions. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your time today, and uh, please do get in touch if you have any questions or um, uh, if we didn't get to all your answers today. Thank you. Okay, there's a couple more questions here. Uh, data sync between different regions and how this will affect performance. Uh, yeah, so so it's going to affect performance just as it would if you were in in any way that you would be pulling from from different regions. Uh, some customers set up multiple data centers, but um, the the speeds with which you're streaming actually happen remarkably fast. And in many cases, different regions don't really play into it as a factor. Uh, I was doing the demo with John for that uh, productions demo that we did earlier with a data center in, uh, in Australia. So I'm working from California and I really didn't have any, any lag uh, that was detectable. Okay. A uh, question here regarding single sign-on. Can LucidLink be integrated with single sign-on? Yes. Uh, can users be managed from an admin user type of setup? Yes. So uh, LucidLink can work with both. It can be integrated with Azure AD and Okta for single sign-on. Okay. Um, one here maybe uh, to follow up from a comment that Darius made about uh, stable internet connection. Uh, if in a higher education environment, internet can be troublesome for students, what would be the minimum requirement of internet to be editing shared files and projects? I mean, it, you know, it sort of ties in, I guess, with, it. it I would say it depends on what the use case is. If it is, you know, with Premiere, um, you know, you're, you're looking at, at sort of that mathematical uh, uh, formula that you, you'd run when trying to work out a facility with a Nexus or something, you know. So if you're working with proxies that are, say, DNX HD 36 megabits per second, so you would want to be pulling down, <clears throat> you'd want a connection that is at least able to serve 36 megabits per second to that user to be able to play, uh, you know, without dropping any frames. So um, it's not, and that's not a huge, you know, it's not really, there's, I don't, there's not really that much overhead um, in our experience with LucidLink, I, I guess. So if you're looking to do, if it is video 
production workflow, um, you know, it, it just needs to be, you're saying, you know, each, if each user is streaming that much at the same time, that would be what they would need to have access to um, as a computer, I'd say. Would that be about yeah. right, David? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I think that sort of answers another question here too about um, about uh, an in-depth in -depth chart breaking down how much bandwidth is required to facilitate media at different resolutions. Um, so it's really about having that, um, having that, you know, uh, it's really depending on codecs and um, et cetera, the... Uh... Yeah, it, it's really, it's really just about the data rates associated with the file. Uh, LucidLink doesn't care what kind of file it is, so it certainly doesn't, it doesn't even know if it's a video or something else. It's just trying to pull the required data at any given moment. It doesn't, it do, it's not aware of codecs. So as long as your data rate is lower than your network speed, you should have no problem yeah. streaming the files. Okay, fantastic. Um, just... Uh... A question about um, uh, LucidLink client. Will there be support for LucidLink client for QNAP and similar embedded systems on storage? It's, uh... Yeah, so uh, that may that may get into more technical than yeah. than I yeah. uh, can do. But um, yeah, let's. I, yeah. I can circle back for you on that one. Okay. Uh, will there be a recording of the webinar? Yes, there will be. Uh, so that will go to everyone. Uh, there's another quick question about egress, just a little bit more clarity. Uh, if multiple people are working on a project and it's full res media, for example, terabytes of data, is all that playing of media in Premiere egress? So uh, I didn't get into the way that your local cache operates when using LucidLink. But what you need to know is only the data that you're playing, only the frames that you're accessing are going to be egressed. And they get egressed into your local cache first before it plays through Premiere. So you're, you're never playing directly from the cloud. You're, you're playing from your local cache, which is streaming from the cloud. Yeah. That means okay. that uh, any blocks that are in your local cache, you can revisit uh, as long as they're still in there without having to re-egress from the cloud. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Uh, question there regarding integrations with other video editing software. I think I can probably answer that one. Um, LucidLink is sort of um, editing system agnostic. So it just appears as a local drive on your Windows or Mac or both or, Win or Linux system. So uh, it doesn't have any special um, requirements for um, uh, integrations. That one. Uh, uh, just a question regarding costs, I suppose. Um, uh, what are the setup and add-on costs? That's probably a, um, um, an easy one to sort of answer. Uh, no setup costs. Uh, when you you can you can work through Digistore to set up a file space. And it's really as easy as selecting the offering that you want, whether it be our bundled IBM storage or whether you have your own custom storage. We have a bring your own model, uh, bring your own storage model. And it's simply registering a file space domain and you're up and running. Okay, we have one more question and then we're done. Um, is there an archive facility? Uh, archive for the LucidLink metadata service. Yes, we have uh, we have archiving and redundancy uh, across the globe to make sure that we can fully operate without any outages. Um, but that being said, if you're if you're talking about archive for yourself, LucidLink is actually a perfect place for all things archive and disaster recovery. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's great. We've got through all the questions. So. Um... Uh, thank you to uh, thank you to uh, everyone for uh, attending the webinar today, and uh, big thank you to our our presenters today, including our international guests. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this was being recorded, and there will be a um, we'll be emailing out a link of the recording once that's uh, fully prepared in the next day or so. 
So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to end the webinar now. Oh.